Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. Hey, how about y'all? Y'all give it up for the band. song and just like, man, I don't even need to go up there uh, tonight. Uh, they, 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 they preach the gospel. Um, and man, we all got a little bit of heaven right there in that moment. Uh, but I had to come up to preach. So we're going we're gonna to roll with it. Um, guys, I, I, wanna, I just want to tell you that I am incredibly proud of every single one of you. Amen. Uh, man, I was just talking to you. I was just talking to Brian out here in the hallway before the service started. Uh, we were just kind of praying over this last service tonight and uh, just thinking about everything that had gone over, on over the course of this weekend. And uh, we both just we both just acknowledged, man, roaring, roaring success, first serve one. Uh, man, the Lord has moved in our midst. He's, he, he's done in our hearts uh, things that we, we didn't think maybe he would do or we didn't think that he could do. Uh, but we've gotten to see the Lord move in a mighty way. I've heard all kinds of stories about things that have gone on. Um, yesterday and today about the way that the Lord is kind of opening our eyes up to the needs in our own community and how we can just see that the Lord wants to do things through us in the lives of the people around us and maybe ways that before this weekend you didn't really recognize. And uh, man, I, I just, I'm so blessed by, by being able to witness that and see that and uh, just a little overwhelmed, if I'm being honest, um, at, at how the Lord has moved uh, throughout the course of this weekend and uh, really, really excited about the future. Um, and, and what the Lord will continue to do. Uh, but as we're, as we're looking at tonight, um, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about this this evening and this, this last session and what we're going to cover, what we're going to talk about. And I just kind of came to a, to, to a place where I felt like, man, as much as the Lord has done, he still wants to do more. Yes. Amen. And, and, and I, don't know, I don't know what it is um, more that the Lord wants to do, but I am confident that the Lord wants to do more in each and every one of us. Um, and I don't know if it's something that, that you're going to experience, uh, the Lord doing something in your life tonight, in this moment tonight, uh, that you get to respond to, or, or if it's something that you know the Lord's been trying to do in your life and you've been holding Him at arm's length throughout the course of this weekend. You may have got to see the Lord do some awesome things in your group and even maybe use you in little ways, uh, but you still feel like you're not ready to do whatever it is the Lord is calling you to do. So what I want to call us to tonight is just a little bit of a moment of reflection um, and just contemplation about what it is that the Lord might be calling us to do in our community as we go out. And uh, where I want to start with uh, tonight is Titus chapter 3. So if you got your Bibles, turn to Titus chapter 3. Uh, before I read this passage, I just want to, I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on here. Okay, so Titus um, is a disciple of Paul. Okay, y'all know who Paul is. Uh, Paul, is uh, he wrote most of the New Testament. He wrote Titus. This is a letter to, Ju to just Titus. And uh, he's, he's been discipling Titus, pouring into Titus, uh, pouring his heart out to Titus, like trying to raise him up uh, to be a leader that he knows God wants him to be in the local church. So Titus is a pastor that Paul left at where he set up a church in Crete, okay? And so he's writing to Titus to encourage him. And what we see here in this passage tonight is that he, he sets out to, to remind Titus to tell the people that are in his care, right? So, so Titus is a pastor. He's telling Titus, the people that he's pastoring, remind them of this thing. Okay, and we're going to see that, that, that Paul believes that reminding the church that Titus is pastoring, the people that Titus is pastoring, will result in something in their life and in their community. Okay, and so, so we're going to look at it, and I think that the same thing can be said to us today, that as we look at this passage, that, that Paul is seeking to remind us of something through this letter that will stir up something in our hearts and in our life. Okay, so follow along with me. We're going to walk through this passage, and I'm going to try to just unpack it. It's going to be on the screen. Uh, we're going to move through it rather quickly because I want to focus and zero in on one specific part. Okay, so it says this in chapter or chapter three, verse one. It says, "Remind them, right, like your church, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind." Always showing gentleness to all people. And he says it, and so he says, like, remind them of these things. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. That's where we were. As he writes to the church that Titus is, is, is pastoring. That's where we once were. Remind them of that. He says this in verse 4. He says, but... When the kindness 
of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Zero in tonight on that word, that word kindness. Okay, like kindness, uh, the word kind. I don't think it's a word that we really, we really quite understand in our, in, our, in our world today, right? Like that's probably a word that you kind of have some feelings about, like you think you know what it means and, and, and maybe you could give me a little bit of a definition of what it means to be kind or what kindness is. Um, but really I think that a lot of times when we think about the word kindness, we think that if somebody is kind, it means that they're, they're nice. Right? We might describe someone as kind if we think that they're a good person. Okay, but kindness is, is so much richer and deeper than that. Okay, the word, the word that, is, that is translated kindness here, as, as Paul was writing, he was writing in Greek, and he used a Greek word, uh, krestos. That's what we translated uh, kindness. And, and, and what it means, what it communicates, is, is a person who does everything in their power to prevent suffering or discomfort in the lives of others. Someone who does everything in their power to prevent or keep from happening suffering or discomfort in the life of others. That's a lot richer than just being nice or just being a good person. When I think about kindness, I don't think there's a lot of very kind people in our world today. And I was, I was thinking about uh, examples of, of kind people throughout history. Uh, and, and one name just kind of came to my mind. It's a name that you might be familiar with, but you may know nothing about her. Uh, Lottie Moon. And y'all have heard of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering? Most of you probably heard of that. Any of y'all know anything about Lottie Moon? Some of you may know a few things. Let me tell you about Lottie Moon. So Lottie Moon was born in 1840, okay? 1840, that's a long time ago, right? And uh, Lottie, Lottie her, her story goes that she absolutely rejected Christianity her whole life growing up. She was in a family and in a context where she heard the gospel frequently. But she rejected Christ and she rejected the church until she turned 18. Okay, so for, for the time that she was, she was older than most of you students in the room, um, she rejected Jesus. She didn't want anything to do with him. Okay, and she tells the story about how when she was a freshman in college, um, she heard the gospel and it just hit her in a new way. It just, it just struck her, right? And she, she, she received the gospel for the first time. And it radically changed the, tra the, the, the trajectory of her life. Okay, and so she, she went on to, to study to be a teacher, right? Like she wanted to teach children. And so she studied to be a teacher, and she started teaching um, in, in grade school. And it was at some point over the next several years after she started teaching that the Lord really began to cultivate in her heart a desire for the Chinese people. Okay, I don't know, I don't know exactly how. I know she writes about it. I didn't, I didn't really find that as I was kind of looking, looking back over her life. But, uh, but she began to feel through the... the just maybe hearing stuff about the Chinese people, uh, learning about their culture, learning about how, how desperate they were to hear the gospel, right? Like how needy they were, how the gospel was not with the Chinese people and they were dying and they did not know who Jesus was. And so they stood as children of wrath under God because they did not know the Lord. The Lord just began to give her a burden for China. She couldn't get there. Right, in 1840, it was a lot more difficult to get to China from America, and it was very expensive, and it was not like a like an overnight trip via plane, and then you could come back a week later. It was it was uprooting your life to go to China, and so she began trying to raise money to do that, and it wasn't until she turned 32 years old, right, that's a long time that she raised money to try to go to China. You know, we sometimes we'll see people raising money to go to, to Africa or to China or to South America on a mission trip, Honduras, whatever. They're selling t-shirts, they're selling bracelets, right? They're raising their own money. Like it was not that easy for her. And so she finally was able to go to China through what was called the Forward Mission Board. And so she uprooted her life. Let's just think about this for a second. When she was finally able to go to China, um, she decided she was going to go because she knew what, that was, what the Lord was calling her to. And she, she turned down a proposal to her boyfriend. Her boyfriend had proposed to her. They were supposed to get married. And she said, I'm going to China. If you can't come to China, I'm sorry. That's what the Lord's calling me to. She said no to her boyfriend. And she said goodbye to her family. She said goodbye to her life. And she went by herself to China. And when she got there, she experienced nothing but fear and rejection from the people. 
Right? Like she got there and, and they didn't want anything to do with her. They closed their doors to, to Lottie. <laughs> After she had uprooted everything she had, she had turned down a proposal and she had gone all the way there, the people didn't want anything to do with her. They feared her and they rejected her. But Lottie longed so much for them to know the Lord that she continued to pray. She just plugged into their community and she had her house and she, she tells the story about how some of the first people that actually gave her the time of day came to her doorstep because they, they smelled the fresh baked cookies that she put out on the windowsill and they wanted some. And so she began to make small little inroads and she began to, to be able to share the gospel with people in China. And, and she, she lived there for 39 years before dying. And she'd write back, she'd write back to America, right? She'd write back to, to the people in America asking like, hey, when, when is more people coming? Right? There's work to be done here, right? Like there's, there's, there's millions of people who don't know Jesus. I can't do this by myself. When are you coming? But most of her life, she lived over there by herself. There weren't other Americans there. There weren't other people coming regularly. Right? Like it wasn't like mission trips that we go on where we get to go and encourage uh, missionaries in other countries and, and, and help them with projects. She was by herself plodding away for 39 years and she would write back and she'd say hey whoever's coming next warn them that this is tough and it is a life of self-denial and it is a life of difficulty warn them of that because that's what they're getting into a lot he did it because she wanted to do everything in her power as meager as it was everything in her power to prevent the suffering and discomfort of the Chinese people and she met needs and she saw them. She welcomed in the broken and those who had no hope. She welcomed in those who were sick and had no family because she longed to be kind to the Chinese people. Lottie was kind. She wasn't just nice. And when you read the New Testament, we see in Jesus the kindest person who ever lived. Jesus, everywhere he went, the Gospels are littered with it. We don't have all the stories of all the things that Jesus did in this Bible. But as Jesus walked the earth, he, he met the needs of the people that he came in contact with. His heart went out to them. He longed to meet needs of people who were broken, right? Like he helped the blind to see. He helped the lame to walk. He helped the dead to rise. But ultimately, Jesus demonstrated his kindness just in him being here to die for our sins. And think about, think about what that definition means. Everything in your power to prevent the discomfort or the suffering in the lives of others. Jesus did that for us ultimately by coming to save us from the suffering of, of getting to spend eternity apart from him. Doing everything in his power required that he come and he die. And he did it. Okay? And, and, and think about service in general, right? Like, so what we've been doing over the course of this week. We have been going out and we've been meeting needs of people in our community. Right? Like, we have done what is in our power to help people who in their own power, they can't do the things that we've been able to do for them um, as easily or as quickly or as, 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 as efficiently as we've been able to this weekend. It's a small little taste of what it means to be kind. Right, like serving, kind people do. Kind people serve. And we've done that over the course of this week. And Jesus served us through his kindness by dying for us. Okay, so when, it, when, when we read this word, uh, kindness, it carries so much more weight than what we, what we think it does. So I want you to flip over to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to read a passage here, and then we'll come back to Titus. So hold your place in Titus, um, and move over here to Ephesians chapter 2. And, and listen, guys, look, I know we're tired. Hey, y'all wake up. Come on, I want y'all to hear this, okay? These words are, are more significant than anything I'm going to say tonight. Like Wes said last night, he read the quote from Jim Elliott. As he read the scripture, he said, this is more significant than anything Jim Elliott could ever say, anything I could ever say. These words here, let them sink into your soul. Follow them on the screen. Hear them like you're hearing them for the first time, okay? It says this in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2. I want to run through it the same way we just did, and I want to zero in at the end. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin." in which you previously lived. You were dead. You were, you were apart from Christ, not breathing spiritually. You were dead because of your sin in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air and the spirit now working in the disobedient. 
we too all. Remember, it's Paul talking. He sounds a lot like he does in Titus. He says, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires. We did what we wanted to do, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. Our sin naturally made us where our destination for our eternity was to be apart from God. We were under his wrath because of our sin. We were dead and without hope. Okay, but here's that awesome statement again that Paul is very fond of. He says in verse 4, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, that he has for you, has made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the, in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the, here it is again, immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. See, Paul says here that we're saved by grace. And what he says is that the way that the grace of God gets to you and me is through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Okay, so look, the grace of God, the kindness of God, the kindness of God is not some abstract thing, right? It's not some, some blob out there that we have to sink into, right? The kindness of our God is a person. His sent son, Jesus, is the kindness of God. He's the representation of his kindness. He is the one come to save us from our sins. He is the one who has come because he longs to prevent our discomfort and our suffering. It's not some, something abstract. See, we have this, uh, I told y'all this, this Greek word, right? Krestos, okay? Krestos, y'all say krestos. Krestos. That means kindness, okay? Uh, you know what the word that Jesus goes by is? Christos. Christos, kindness. Christos, Christ. Okay, I don't think it's any coincidence that those two words are so close. You know, our pastor, uh, uh, Dean, has, has made, made this point before that, that these two words are so close to one another. Right, like Christos and Christos. Because here, here's, here's what I think this means. I, just, I think that it's no, no mistake, it's no accident that the word for kindness and the word for Christ are so close. Because I think that Jesus himself defines kindness. Okay, so it's, it's as if at the, at the very heart of Jesus, in his innermost being, he is kind. Right? Like it's not so much that we can we should describe Jesus as kind as we should say, you want to know what kind is? Look to Jesus. He is the definition written in flesh. Oops. Um, it's, it's almost as if this is gonna sound weird. As I was kind of thinking about this, uh, it's gonna it's gonna sound it's gonna sound odd to talk about Jesus this way, maybe for some of us, but it's almost as if Jesus cannot help himself. But when he sees us in our need, come to us. It's almost as if there's this compulsion within him that wells up when he sees us in need. Because he loves us so much. Right? Like it's like he sees us in our in our sin and he can't he can't prevent himself from from from, from going to us. Right? Like it's 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 who he is. It's 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 his very nature. Right? Like kindness is such a part of his heart that, that when he sees people in need, he sees people suffering, he sees people who are who are are, are are experiencing discomfort, he has to go to them. See what that means for us? That means that means that we when we are at our our most broken, when we are in our place of deepest need. When we feel like we're the furthest from Jesus, when we feel the weight of our sin, he's drawn to us, not away from us. See, for Jesus to be kind, we, we like to think sometimes that Jesus, because of our sin, stands far away. 
but it's because of our sin. It's exactly because of our sin that Jesus draws near. Because he's kind and he can't help but do what's in his power to, to meet our needs and meet us in our discomfort and, and, and to meet us in our suffering and to make a way. He's kind to us today. You know that word immeasurable that it says in, 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 verse, in verse 8 or in verse, uh, verse 7. It says that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us. You know what it means for God's grace to be immeasurable? It means that it doesn't matter how much sin we, we, we commit. It doesn't matter how far we feel like we are from God. It doesn't matter how far we feel like we've drifted. Our, our, our drifting and our brokenness and our sin, as vast as it may seem, is matched and exceeded by the immeasurable riches of his grace to us through the kindness of Christ. And I love that word, too, in that verse. Okay? Uh, it's, some, of your, some of your translations might say towards. Right? Like his, his grace, uh, the measure, immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us. Right? Like, so that means, again, that no matter where we are, no matter where we sit, the kindness of Christ is towards us. He pursues us. He meets us where we are. We don't have to come to him. He is, he is actively moving towards us with his kindness to meet our needs and to meet our, our, our brokenness and to make us whole, to fill us up, to give us joy, to give us peace, to give us hope. He is towards us. Jesus came to us. We did not have to make it to him. He had to come to us. So his grace is towards you. It's pursuing you. And listen, some of you in here may need to hear that tonight. That, that your brokenness, your sin, your, your, your messed upness, your deadness does not mean that Jesus is out of reach. In fact, it's, it's you and your condition that Jesus is drawn to. He wants to meet you where you are. Just like we did this week, right? We didn't wait for people to come to us. Right? Like we didn't we didn't wait for payment before we did what we've done. We didn't have a list um, of people who had come to us asking us to come to them. We went to them and met them where they were in whatever situation they were in and met their need asking nothing in return. Jesus has done the same for us on an infinite scale. He came to us in our brokenness and he met us where we were and he can meet some of you where you are tonight. He wants to. He is close. Okay, so with this idea of what kindness is, I want us to flip back over to Titus and I want us to look at the rest of this passage. So we were in chapter 3. We left off in verse 4. We'll pick up there again. It says, But when the kindness of Christ, the kindness of God our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, that's Jesus, He saved us. We know this, right? Like it's not by works of righteousness that we had done, but it was according to to his mercy. We did not deserve it. He offers it. It is because of his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his spiritly on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, now, now Jesus, because uh, he is gracious, looks on us as if we'd never sinned, right? We've been justified by his grace we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things. Okay. So look, Paul's writing to Titus and he says, look, he tells them all this stuff about the kindness of God, like where we were, right? And then he says, he says where we were, what Jesus did, where we are now. And he says that I want you to insist on these things. It is trustworthy. Okay, like this is, he's saying to Titus, like, Bank on this. Hold on to this. 
believe this. Let this sink into your very soul. Let it, let it become a part of who you are. This is trustworthy. Bank on it. And then he tells Titus, insist on these things to the people around you. Right? Like constantly put this in front of them that because of the kindness of our God, we now know God. Put it in front of them constantly. Remind them of it. Let it sink into their soul. Why does he say that? He says this. Listen, this is so good. He says, I want you to insist on these things. Hear this. So that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. Look, this is here. This is where... This is where the application comes in, okay? Look, we all lean in for these last few minutes, okay? Hear me. Because of the kindness of God, we should be kind. Another way to say that is we've talked about what kindness is, is that because of the kindness of God, we serve others. We do good works. Okay? It's not, it's not because we feel like good works will do anything for us. There's just something about <coughs> when the, the, the good news of what Jesus has done really gets into our hearts. Right? Like when the kindness of Christ stirs up within us, when we begin to, to sink every part of our lives into the kindness of Christ, we embrace it, we let it become a part of who we are, we cannot help but be kind to the people around us and to meet the needs around us and to do good works in our communities, good, do good works in our families, do good works on our teams, do good works uh, on the field, do good works in the hallways of our schools and classes, everywhere we go. When the kindness of Christ has transformed our inside and we are different because of it and it has become a part of us, we cannot help but do good works. It becomes a part of who we are just like it becomes a part or it is a part of who Jesus is. Okay, and notice what it says here. It says that we might be careful to do good works. We might be intentional to devote ourselves to good works. Here's, here's the truth, guys. We've talked about this all week. Serving people can be difficult, right? Like if, if we looked at our lives over the last several months, like how, how often could we say we, we've had a servant's heart towards other people? motivated by our kindness towards others, right? Like a longing to do everything in our power to meet needs around us because we just can't help it. Our natural drift is not towards service, guys. Our natural drift is towards selfishness and, 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 and longing to just do what's good for us. It's not towards being Christ-like. It's not towards kindness. It's towards cruelty. It's towards selfishness. <coughs> And so what we have to constantly do is insist on these things. Remind ourselves of these things. Throw ourselves into the kindness of Christ and let it transform us. Because then we can live contrary to what our flesh desires. And we can go out and we can serve others. Okay, what I don't want to happen, guys... What I don't want to happen from an awesome week like this, like, like if this week is only about this week and nothing changes in our lives as we go out, man, we've done some awesome things, but really it doesn't, it doesn't last. Right? Like this, this camp is, is not just about meeting needs in our community. It's about opening our eyes to see needs in our community so that we continue to meet needs in our community after we've left. It doesn't mean a whole lot if we just get together once a year to serve in our community. Like, it doesn't matter if once a year we pick up a chainsaw for, for some old lady um, across town and, and, and cut up a tree. Or we, we pull weeds for some, some, somebody we've never met before. Like, it's awesome to serve people. But, if, man, if we don't take that part with us, it doesn't mean anything. If we are going to let this weekend mean something, we have to let the kindness of Christ sink so deeply into us that we become kind ourselves. And we go out with the same heart that we've just started to cultivate here this weekend. We have to continue to cultivate this heart. Otherwise, we will just drift back to the selfish way that we were living two weeks ago. Heck, the selfish way we were living 72 hours ago. If this is going to stick, then we have to commit to insisting on these things, reflecting on the kindness of Christ in our hearts and in our lives. 
the kindness of Christ towards us. Because of it, we are kind. We serve others. So, man, we light up this board over here. Uh, I'll bring that board out real quick. Put a spotlight. Um, so Jack and Riley are bringing this board over here that we filled up. And, and hey, listen, first off, hey, man, you got it? Here they come. It's real heavy. Very heavy. All right, y'all give it up for Jack and Riley. Thank y'all, fellas. Okay, so y'all see this, this board? We've got it lit up real pretty over here. Uh, listen, first of all, I want to say well done. Y'all have reached a lot of people. So for those of y'all who are in here who haven't been here over the course of the weekend, what this is, this is Forest in Lamar County. And, and we, have, we have been serving across these counties, and we've just been filling up this board with names of people that we've served over the course of two days. Um, just the names of people we've come in contact with, the names of people who we, we were able to, to bring food to, the names of people that we were able to, uh, you know, take care of uh, some lawn care that they needed, that we were able to pray for, uh, that we were able to provide groceries with, all kinds of things that we've been doing in this community. Y'all have done an awesome job. There's a lot of names on this board, and I'm really proud of y'all for what we've been able to do over the course of two days. That's a lot of names. But you know what I've noticed about this board? There's a lot of blank space. You know what that tells me? There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot that we can do. So here's what I want to do tonight, guys, as we're getting ready to respond. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get y'all, uh, Jack, Taylor, y'all go ahead and kind of get this stuff up here so I can kind of walk them through what this is going to look like. Uh, Lad, you can come on up. Um, we've got sticky notes. We've got markers, and we're going to spread them out across here. And here's what I want us to do. I want you to think about, as we, in, in, in the aim of, of letting the kindness of Christ sink into our hearts and into our soul, I want us to, to think about people that as we go back to normal life, we can continue this service that we've begun to cultivate in our heart as we go back. I want you to think about the people that you're going to come in contact with as you go back to school. I want to think about the households you're going to go back into. I want you to think about the teams that you're about to be playing for and practicing for again. Um, and I want you to think about the people that Christ wants you to serve in your own life. Because if in a, if in a week's time we can't add another name to this board, what's it, what's it all been about? What's it matter? Yeah, we've met some needs. We've prayed to some people. We've had the Lord use us in some pretty awesome ways. But ultimately, man, if this car, if this heart hasn't sank into us, we couldn't add another name to that. It wouldn't, it won't matter. So I want you all to think about, pray about who it is the Lord's calling you to serve as you go back. Who it is that you can you can do everything in your power to meet their needs, be it spiritual needs, physical needs, people you need to share the gospel with, friends who need to come to know Jesus, family that need to come to know Jesus, that lady down the street who needs her, her yard mowed, right? That person that you saw working on a project that looked a little bit too big for themselves. I want you to write their names down. I want you to stick them to that board. All of us have someone we can continue to serve as we leave this place. And I want us to write those names on that board, and I want us to pray about how we can have the courage and the boldness to go out there and actually try to meet those needs. I want you to, I want you to get it in your head how you're going to do it when you leave from here. Or like, don't leave it as some sort of an abstract thing that you, you are going to try to do when you go back. Like, think about it now and pray about how you're going to meet the needs of the people in your community, even after serving one ends fill that up. And I'll stick that thing on the wall and I want us to be reminded every day that we, we come into this youth room that, man, there are people that we are to continue to serve. And hey, if, if next week when you come to youth, you have another name that you thought that you need to serve, write it down on a sticky note, stick it on that board. Let's fill it up. I want the, I want the sticky notes to be falling off because we've got so many names over here. Because we are a people who have a 
because of the kindness of Christ towards us, are kind to others. All right, so let's pray.